our passage last week, we, we talked about like misconceptions or like misunderstandings of who Jesus is. And we saw how that was happening with John and with John's disciples. Um, we saw the people right there at the time when Jesus was walking around and teaching had even misunderstandings then of who Jesus was. And I think, I think some of those misunderstandings, there's a lot of misunderstandings now still of who Jesus is. Some of us, maybe the first time we heard about Jesus was simply the, like the fire and brimstone Jesus of judgment. <laughs> like, that's a message that's taught frequently. It's just like Jesus is the, the you know, judge and be scared. And, you know, there's an element. Yeah, that's absolutely true. We're going to see that this morning. There's also like kind of a misconception of Jesus that teaches Jesus as love without the judgment. Like there is very much a message of Jesus that is that too, but both sides of that are completely misconceptions because you need to see both sides to begin to have an understanding of who he is. Um, the reality is that Jesus will judge and that there are consequences, but then he is love. and He is more loving than anyone that you will ever know. Those things can't be separated. They're not different viewpoints. We talked about misconceptions last week. I think we look at both of those characteristics and there's misconceptions to be found there. And Jesus is going to be dealing with both of those characteristics this morning. And so let's get into our passage because he's going to start talking about this. We're going to be in Matthew 11 once again. We did 1 through 19 last week. We're going to be doing 20 through 30 to the end of the chapter this week. So we're going to start in verse 20 of Matthew 11. So that starts in verse 20. It says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. This is Jesus, obviously. He began to rebuke these cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted in heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good to your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son re wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light." There's a pretty extreme contrast in the characteristics of God that are seen in this passage. Like when you look at the beginning of this passage and you look at the end of this passage, there's a pretty extreme contrast going on from, you know, judgment to, you know, rest and my way is easy. <laughs> like, you know, there's an extreme contrast that's going on. Like, but Jesus starts this passage and as he as he gets into what he's saying right here, he begins this by rebuking entire cities, like rebuking the entire cities. We saw that in verse 20, and it says, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. To rebuke somebody or something is to really express like great disapproval or, or dissatisfaction with what is going on. <laughs> like it is like, this isn't working. This isn't right. I am extremely dissatisfied with what is going on in these places. Jesus is rebuking these entire cities because he does not like what he sees. 
does not like what is happening there. He starts calling out these cities by name. He calls out the city of, of Chorazin and, and Bethsaida in verse 21 that we read there. And even in verse 23, he calls out Capernaum, which we've talked about Capernaum quite a bit. Because like, it's kind of crazy because Capernaum is, is kind of like the home base city for Jesus. Like that's the home base city for the disciples and for Jesus. They like, you know, even like we've already seen them leave this area and they went out and did some ministry other places and then they came back to, to Capernaum. It's like where they're based at. They got family there. There's some houses and stuff that they're staying at there. This is the place they come back to. And by the fact that they're there a lot and Jesus is in that area a lot and Jesus is saying, mighty works have been done here. It's like probably a lot went down in this place because it was where they were at probably quite a bit more than a lot of these other places. Like we know that a lot must have happened. And we know a lot must have happened in all of these cities. Um, but it's crazy when he, he's talking here because he goes so far to say that like a town like Capernaum, he's like, I've done a lot of work here. You've seen me, you've seen my, you've heard my words, you've seen my works. He's like, if I had done these things, like if I had done these things in the land of, in, of Sodom, <laughs> in this like which, you know, if you remember the Old Testament, there's these, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you remember the story, there was an incredible amount of sin in these cities. And God, as the God of judgment as well, chose himself to rain down sulfur and fire upon these cities and they were completely destroyed. That's the reality. There was a lot of sin going on. God destroyed them. Where those cities were believed to be, like where Sodom was believed to be historically, like that area is still like a desolate wasteland to today. Like it's that area has not regrown. Um, like where they believe that it was at, like all of those thousands of years ago, God destroyed it and destroyed it to the point where it has no way recuperated even to this day. Like that's serious. Like God took care of business. But Jesus says, like if I was doing what I'm doing now for you guys and I did it there, they would have made it. <laughs> it's just like, that's like you can't imagine everything that he's been doing. And he's like, and you guys, you're not paying attention, you're not seeing, you're not hearing what it is that I'm saying. It's like, I think it's just kind of crazy. Like, were these people just really not listening? Were they really not paying attention to what Jesus was saying and doing? They actually had the opportunity to see him firsthand. Like, we haven't had that opportunity. We got a lot of things like we talked about. There's a whole bunch, like we talked about last week, there's a whole bunch of evidence, I believe, that clearly says that Jesus is who he says he is. I'm convinced of that. These people had him walking and talking right in front of them. They, they saw them, like when we read about some of these miracles, they saw it happen like it was right in front of them. Like when we look and we hear, we read what he's saying, we hear him speak of the kingdom, we hear him speak of his father, we hear him speak of himself, we hear him teach like these incredible parables and these incredible teachings, like they were sitting there in the crowd listening to him. We read them and I'm astounded by it. They were sitting there listening to him say it. But it's an interesting thing to note here, though, that Jesus calls out these particular cities. He calls out these three cities. And if you actually look on a map, like these three cities are not like far spread away from each other. Like they're actually all three of them kind of incorporated within an area that's smaller than the Coachella Valley. Like the distance from Capernaum to Bethesda or Bethsaida it's probably like 11 or 12 miles, the distance from Capernaum over to um, the other one, Corazon or whatever, is like another, it's again, it's like 10 miles in the other direction. So they're not very far out. They're all within like a 20 mile area. Um, and Jesus is, like I said, calling all of these cities out. But what's interesting is Jesus says, I did a whole, like we just read, he's like, I did a whole bunch of mighty works in these areas. And we don't know you know, exactly what all those things are. There's not actually gospel records of like what he did in those particular cities. Um, and which is also something for us to remember, like, you know, the, the gospels aren't a hundred percent record of every minute that Jesus walked on the earth. It's what God chose to have written down. And there's a passage in the Gospel of John, which is just something to keep in mind because it's actually an incredible truth. When we think about the fact that we don't have a record of everything Jesus did, the Gospel of John, chapter, 25, chapter 21, 
verse 25. So John 21, 25 makes an incredible statement. It's just this one verse, 21, 25 of John. It says, there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose would even, that even the world could not contain the books that would have to be written about it. It says, there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written down one by one, I suppose that even the entire world itself could not contain the books that would be written. When Jesus says, I did mighty works in these places, he did a lot. Like he was doing a lot. He did things that obviously people couldn't even see as he was working in hearts and minds. And like there was things that like they weren't even visible that Jesus was at work doing. But he did a lot. But we saw here that he calls out these particular cities. And he gives us a truth here, which is, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's difficult to wrestle with. Um, like he doesn't always reveal every little part of things. It's something we have to wrestle with a little bit. But he says to these three cities, he says, because of everything I did here, because of everything that I taught here, because of what you had access to, because of the mighty works that happened there, he said, you will face a stricter judgment than these other cities that didn't have that. Like that's a, the Bible doesn't really spell out for us, you know, exactly what that means. But we know there's an old saying, which I think kind of helps us understand this. I've heard it many times over the years, but there's an old saying that says, where there's greater light, there's greater responsibility. That's what really Jesus is saying here. Like you guys, it was right in front of you. The teaching was right in front of you. I was right in front of you. You were seeing the work. It was right in front of you. The other cities he mentioned, Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, they didn't have that. Like they didn't have that right in front of them. He's like, you guys had that. There's going to be stricter consequences because you refused it. The Bible doesn't spell out exactly what that means for us. It just tells us right here by Jesus' own mouth that that's real, that that exists. I said, God doesn't always tell us every little thing about every little thing. Like there's a lot of things that are just God's to know. He lets us in to know enough of it. And for us, when we know enough of this truth, it's like, well, we know some things. We've seen some things. We have his word. We have some responsibility to it. Like, that's where I would take from this. Like, he said, God doesn't spell out what all of that is, but there's definitely truth that is applicable to us in it. See, there's a lot of people, like, when we think about these cities and we think about Jesus, their ministry, and we think about these other cities that didn't have that same opportunity, when we think about that, we even now recognize that there's a lot of people just like those other cities. There's a lot of people like the other cities mentioned that have never really heard the truth of Jesus Christ. They've never been confronted with his work, confronted with his deity, confronted with his mighty works and words, confronted with the truth of the gospel. There's a lot of people that have never understood who Jesus is and sin and the consequences of sin and Jesus as Savior from the consequences of sin. There's a lot of people that haven't heard or understood that. The Bible says, how will people hear if nobody goes and tells them? That's what it says in the book of Romans. It says people need to hear, but how will they hear if nobody goes and tells them? There's a lot of people that haven't heard. I actually saw a, I think it was this morning or yesterday, you think of the, like the Western world. I saw a map of Europe like yesterday and there was percentages, it was the U.S. and Europe, like percentages of how many people that definitively say there is a God. Almost 100% of Europe fell within the 10 to 29% bracket. 10 to 29% of people in all of the countries in Europe will definitively say there is a God. So that means 90 to 71% of people will adamantly say there is not a God. That's in Europe right now, you know, America is very much trending in that direction, too. I think a lot of the third world, the percentages are much higher in there is a God, but maybe they don't know the truth of the God, the one God. For us, we know. When I think of the Western world, most of the Western world has a concept that there is a God, that there is this one named Jesus, that there is this salvation. Most people in the Western world have a basic understanding of that. I think we still have the opportunity to go and make sure. <laughs> 
but most do. And so I think of most of the Western world, like, we better be aware of the fact that, you know, greater light, more truth, more understanding, more responsibility, potentially more consequences. But I think it's possible to read this. I think it's possible to read what Jesus is saying here in this passage and be like, man, it would be, maybe it'd be better for me if I never heard anything. Like Jesus is saying, it'd be easier if I was ignorant of these things. It'd be easier if I never heard any of this truth. But please notice what Jesus says in, when he says in verse 22, and, and he says it down there about Capernaum too. He's like, he says it will be more tolerable. He doesn't say it's going to be good. He doesn't say that there's not going to be any consequences. He doesn't say that. He just says it might be a little less, but it's never a thing. It's never like a, like if you didn't hear these things or if you didn't hear as much of these things that there's not going to be any consequences. And the Bible is very clear that every single one of us is a sinner and sin has consequences. But if you're not at the, like if you haven't heard as much, then you're not as accountable for as much, but it's still not the good side of this equation. It's more tolerable doesn't mean good. It means more tolerable. <laughs> so please don't get that confused. When we sit here and we look at this and we look at even the contrast from the first part of this passage to the second part of this passage, like when we see judgment, judgment is going to be contrasted with Jesus's goodness and the, the Jesus that says, I will like, help your soul find rest. <laughs> like I am the source of your soul's rest. It's like more tolerable consequences or the God who welcomes you and brings your soul to rest. That's a dramatic difference still. In these first five verses, like again, it's been kind of working up over these last couple of weeks, but in these first five verses, again, we, we have this like really sobering reality of God as judge of God's view of sin and of judgment. The reality is like we can't skirt around these things. We can't ignore them. It would be a great disservice for any of us to not talk about them. We have to talk about them. It's real and it's true that every single one of us is going to stand before God one day. We're either going to stand before him knowing him, knowing all of him, like we're seeing this morning, we're either going to stand in front of him, knowing him and entering his, his rest and his goodness, or we're going to come either not knowing him at all and still facing consequences, or knowing him and refusing him and facing worse consequences. So it's like not knowing him at all, consequences. Knowing and refusing, greater consequences. Or knowing and surrendering to him and goodness and rest and mercy and grace and it's just like, that's where we're headed. So, there's so much at stake when we see both sides of this equation. When we see the God of judgment and the God of rest. There is so much at stake with what you believe and what you think about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like we have to talk about both sides of these. But let's continue on to the second half and, and begin to see the great contrast here. Let's read verses 25 through 30 again. Verses, the first five verses are kind of all about God as judge, but 25 through 30, the contrast happens. It says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good to your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The judgment is now contrasted with, with knowing God and knowing the God who is inviting us to find rest for our souls in him. 
Jesus shifts the subject here. He begins the shifting of the subject, and it's actually, he's having a dialogue with his father. Jesus thanks his father. Like, God the Son is now thanking God the Father. And it's an interesting thing that he thanks him for. But what I think is really cool, too, is that we see the relationship that they have. Like, we see the relationship between the Son and the Father. It's like, we have to realize, and we have to know, and, and maybe you don't, and maybe... Like, I don't think any of us has a perfect understanding, but that there is a trinity. Like, there is one God, yet he exists in three separate persons. Like, that's the, the truth of that, the ultimate truth of that is beyond, I think, our lowly minds to fully grasp the reality of one ultimate and almighty God. And yet he is three completely distinct persons that have existed for all of eternity together. And they have this intimacy of relationship. The Son of God is talking to God, the Father, at this moment. But what do we find Jesus talking to his Father about? What is he thanking God the Father for? He tells his Father, he says, thank you, thank you that you didn't choose to reveal himself to, it says, the wise and the prudent. He says that in verse 25. And if we break down his words there, it's kind of like what we talked about before, that he says he didn't re really choose to reveal himself to those that think that they are wise or that think that they are clever or, or are really self-righteous, like God the Father wasn't choosing to reveal himself to these people that they think they already know and think they already got it together. Like Jesus is like, you're not revealing yourself to these people. He says instead, thank you, Father, that you're choosing to reveal yourself to the babes <laughs> or to the, the children or to little people like us. <laughs> I mean, it's like, thank you, Father, you are revealing yourself to the people that are lowly and desire to know you. Jesus says in verse 27 there, he says that basically that his father has entrusted all things to him. He says nobody knows the son like the father. He talks about, again, this incredible intimacy of relationship in the, the, what we call the Godhead or the Trinity, the you know, one God but three. It's like they have this intimacy of relationship. He's like, Nobody knows Jesus the Son like God the Father does. Nobody knows God the Father does like Jesus the Son does. But then he goes and he, he goes beyond that. And he goes to this, this incredible truth that except the ones that Jesus is choosing to reveal his Father to. There's a bridge that is now happening between this like perfect understanding between you know, God the Son and God the Father that nobody else has. Jesus has now become the bridge to say, I will bring that understanding to the babes, to the, the children, to the, the simple people like us. It's like there's an understanding there that no other being in all of existence has between God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus is like, now I'm bridging that gap to you people so you could have the opportunity to know him too. Incredible truth. It's the only reason, the only reason why we know him is because Jesus is bridging that gap. When we look at this and we understand the God of judgment earlier and we now begin to see this other aspect of God right now, we know that, I hope we know, I hope we know that we deserved every bit of that judgment. We deserved every bit of it. We deserved it because the sin within us, the sin we were born with, the certain sin that we acted on, every one of us acted out in sin, every single one of us, but that sin caused for us to deserve the judgment of God. That sin that we had, it broke, like it completely broke the relationship between God and people. Sin breaks that. It's like, it goes all the way back. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden that sin broke and divided the relationship between God and man. The sin that was there deserves the God of judgment. Jesus is now bridging the gap to say, but I can bring you to rest. I can fix this relationship. Again, we see Jesus is the one that is now revealing his father, said to, he said, like the children, to the little people. There was no way to fix the relationship unless God the Son stepped in. 
But Jesus stepped in and got to work. That's what we're seeing all through the gospel. He is on the path. He's getting to work. He's doing the work. He is doing the only thing possible to fix the relationship between God and man. We know from like the whole picture of Scripture, as it says here, that you know, Jesus is revealing His Father to us. We know from the rest of Scripture that the entire Godhead is involved. It says the Holy Spirit also is one that helps us to understand Jesus. It helps us to understand the Father. All three persons of God are fully at work to help us to understand this almighty God that we serve. We see this little picture of Jesus starting that. You know, I talked about at the beginning how there's these misconceptions and sometimes it's one side of this and sometimes it's the other side of it. But we need to know both. Because if we didn't understand our sinfulness and we didn't understand the consequences, if we didn't understand God who is judged that will deal with these consequences, then we would never understand a need for a, a Savior in God the Son to help free us and save us from those consequences. If you teach only one side of this message, the picture is broken. The truth is broken. Without sin, judgment, consequences, and God Almighty as judge, there is never going to be a need for Jesus, Savior, God the Son, who can save us from our sins. The whole picture has to be there. When we think of Jesus, we understand his heart when we see the things that he teaches and what he teaches us all through this book so far and the rest of scripture. Like Jesus knew that our relationship with his father was broken. Jesus decided that he was going to take the fall for our problems. Jesus was going to take our consequences on him. Jesus says, I'm going to go die on that cross. You deserved it. I'm going to go die on it. I'm going to take that wrath. Jesus now tells us that if we believe in him and we believe the things that he's done for us, if we turn from our sin, then Jesus came back to life and said, I'll take you back to my father. And when you get there, because of me, it's going to be all right. You're not going to face God the judge. You're going to face God that is still judge, but we're going to face him in love and goodness because of the work that Christ has done. We're seeing that all through this book. And Jesus hasn't even got to the end of that story yet as we continue through this gospel but we know what's coming. At the end of this book, and we won't go there right now, but at the end of this book in Matthew 28, Jesus says, in Matthew 28, there's the Great Commission. And Jesus says that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth and go and make disciples. We see in this passage, Jesus says in Matthew 11, kind of starting the same process, it says that all things have been delivered or entrusted to me as God the Son. And we see him actively making disciples. Like Jesus is starting the chain of discipleship right now that reached us. Like when you think about this, like how crazy that is. Jesus taught these guys. He taught a group of people that were gathered around him at that time. But the truth of Jesus and the gospel has reached through thousands of years now and made it to us. Like the chain is unbroken. And we still are part of that chain. Hopefully, we bear the responsibility to link more people to the chain. But Jesus started it here. He said, all authority has been given me to do that, and I'm doing it. I'm giving it to you people. I'm telling you people about it. And then at the end of this book, one of the last things he's going to say, he's like, all that authority that's been given to me, I have that authority. Go and do what I'm telling you to do. John 14, 6, that we've looked at before, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to my Father but through me. That's what we're seeing here today. Jesus says, nobody knows my Father like I do. Nobody knows me like he does. The only way you're going to get there is when I reveal him to you. He's the only way. He's the only way. But listen to how he describes it. Let's read verses 28 through 30. All of these big, important topics, but man, verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's like we could deny him and we could deal with judgment. 
or we could come to him and him only and actually find rest for our souls. You're not going to find it anywhere else. There is nowhere else where you are going to find actual rest for your soul but in him. It's the only place to find it. There's a passage that I, I love. It reminds me of this truth, and I want to go to this one together. I've gone to this passage countless times in Psalm 116. So it's kind of like right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 116. And actually, I meant to, uh, we actually have this part of this first written on a, a board upstairs, and I was going to bring it down as a, a visual thing, but forgot about that. Um, but we got the Bible to look at it in, so. Psalm 116. I love this passage. We're going to read verses just 1 through 9 of Psalm 116. Starting in verse 1, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me. The pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This is like one of my favorite passages in Scripture. You read what the psalm writer is saying here, and the psalm writer says, I found trouble. I found sorrow. I felt like I was going to die. <laughs> he says, then I called upon the name of the Lord. And, says, and he says that the Lord is gracious and righteous and merciful, that the Lord preserves simple people like him. He said, I was brought to my lowest and he saved me. And he makes this this statement in verse 7, which is a statement that has always stuck with me. He says, return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully or graciously with you. Jesus, and listen to this, Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all you who labor or are heavy laden, like when the psalmist is talking about where my soul finds rest, Jesus is going to explain it here. He says, if you are just busy laboring, if you are heavy laden with these things, when I think of the, the labor part, that's like, you know, we can look at, you know, what's weighing us down is our, is our sin and it absolutely is on there. But we look at the labor part, like what we're trying to do. It's like, it's like, I'm trying to work this out. Like, I'm trying to make my way. I'm trying to find these things. Like, I'll make my way to God. Like, I'm laboring towards working these things out. It's like what we're ultimately trying to do to work the ultimate questions out, like what we're trying to do. And we look at the heavy laden part. I think it's talking about really like what other people are putting on us, like what other people are, are you know, putting on our backs, like what they're saying about us, what they're telling us to do, how they're telling us to figure these things out. It's like we've got, you know, all this work that we're trying to do and, and all this stuff on our back that we're, we're trying to carry. And Jesus is like, I can take care of that. So why wouldn't we let him? I think about that question. I think for some of us, maybe it's pride. Maybe it's like, I'm a man. I'm going to work these things out. Or I'm just, I know I can do this. I'm capable. I can work these things out. Like, I think maybe it's pride a lot of times that gets in the way of like, I'm going to bow down and lay it all down at Jesus' feet. I think I can handle this. You can't handle this. You can't handle standing for God as judge when you haven't come by way of Jesus. Don't think you can handle that. For some, maybe it's pride. I think I can work all these things out. Maybe we're worried about what other people are going to say. Maybe we're worried about, about all of the opinions that people have, like all of the things that people are laying on top of us that we're carrying, that, that we're trying to do, that other people are telling us that we need to do. But I believe that right now, like if we're in any way in that situation where, where we're trying to work it out or we're, if we're carrying whatever other people are saying, 
I think when we read what Jesus says here, it's the moment where we need to stop and we need to lay it down. Like we need to give it up. Instead of like what we're trying to work out, instead of what everybody else is saying, we need to be concerned with one thing. And that's not our efforts. That's not other people's input. We need to be concerned about where we stand before the Almighty God. Other people can't talk me to Jesus. I can't work myself to Jesus. Jesus says, come and I will give you rest. I will fix the relationship that you have with my Father. Through all these weeks, we've talked about fearing Him. We've talked about taking Him seriously. We've talked about people and maybe us as well having all of these misunderstandings about who He is. Today, Jesus says, like, judgment is coming. We can't ignore that side of things. But then he's basically like, I'm standing here too, and with me and me alone, instead of judgment, you can find rest all the way down to your soul. What that requires of us is a repentance of our sin and believing in his salvation for us. He died and he was buried and he rose again to save a sinner like me. The crazy thing is that it's there. It's free. It's amazing. It's offered to us by him. I sit here and like, I know what that rest feels like. I know what it feels like. I know what the psalmist means. That's why that passage has meant so much to me is when the psalmist said, return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I felt that. Like, I know what that feels like. Times might still be really hard. Like, I know that we're still going to go through some things. But I know and I have felt and I understood what the psalmist said. Because I felt it too. I just want to make sure that you know it too. This isn't like a, you know, this is never going to be like a, any of us are, are better than any, there's never going to be any shame and like I haven't felt that yet. There's never going to be any shame and I don't know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus yet. The whole point of what we're doing here is, let's talk about that. Like there should never be any shame in the step of growth. I think as a church, what we would do is we would rejoice in the growth. That's what we want. Our soul, as Jesus is saying, can only find rest, can only find peace in him. We're not going to find it anywhere else. Maybe we've been running around our entire life laboring, trying to find that peace. Maybe we've had all types of other people telling us our entire life how to find that peace. Maybe we've been looking for that satisfaction. Maybe we've been trying to work it all out. The only place you're ever going to find that is in Christ. And when you understand this rest that he brings, then you can know that even if all of life is going crazy, there's still this undercurrent of rest and peace and an understanding that there is a God who cares for me even in the midst of all of this craziness. I think of you know, James 1, it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience and all of those things. It's like, why would you count it all joy in these trials? Because there is an understanding of the very grace, love, and mercy of God that even when the trial is going on, and there's like a storm shelter right in the middle of it that is His rest, His grace, His love, His salvation. And you can sit there, even while the storm is raging, and know that there is rest to be had in Him. Jesus says, come to me if you want that rest. The psalmist, in all of his I'm about to die moment, says, my soul can find rest because of how gracious God has been with me. But there's one final point as we close. I want you to notice something. Our soul could find rest because of the salvation that we have in Jesus. But notice this, and he's, it's kind of what he says in these last few verses, that, that Jesus didn't say restful life. He says ultimate rest in him. He said a restful soul. And in this last point, we look at, you know, Jesus says, you know, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
Jesus' easier yoke is still a yoke, and Jesus' lighter burden is still a burden. They're not negative things. Like we find ultimate rest and peace for our soul in Jesus, but that rest doesn't mean that it's just time to sit back and run our days out. You know, like obviously I'm not the sports guy, but sports analogy is not time to take the knee. <laughs> so, you know, I know that much. Um, but it's not time when we have, now that we have the rest in Christ, it's not time to take the knee and run it out. It's not that time. The ultimate rest for our soul doesn't mean restful life and we're not going to take care of business. When we see this yoke here, a yoke is there because it connects like, like the picture here is like an ox and you put the yoke on the ox and the yoke connects them to the burden that they're like the weight that they're pulling to get the job done. Like Jesus is still connecting us as his people to his mission. It's like he says, my, my yoke is easy and it's my burden is light because the alternative is judgment and consequences. His is like love, rest, all those things. But it's like, but you know, come with me and we still got work to do. But the great thing about that is even when that yoke is on, even when that burden is there, we're still connected to Christ and we're connected to each other. We're not in this alone. We're not trying to, again, labor and work this out on our own. We got him. You know, as I said many times before, and I think we're still, you know, praying and, you know, looking forward to what like the opportunities may be for us, like together to serve people. And like we've always said, like we're open for that. Bring the ideas. Like if you see a, a like even somewhere where you can partner, or there's a way that we can get out and serve this world and serve our community and love on them. Jesus said earlier, like there's a lot of people that still don't know about me. And I think even in our community, there's a lot of people that still don't know about him. Or maybe they've heard of him, but they've never seen his people act out in, in love and in graciousness and in mercy and in care and, and like actually bringing his characteristics to the table as we serve. Like maybe they've never seen that. Maybe they need to see that. Like we're just the little people that, you know, the babes and the children that Jesus brought into the fold. He's like, I still got this easier burden. I still got this lighter yoke. And like, we still got work to do. For us, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people that need to hear him. I just pray that God uses this church and this community. And our mission statement is we put it up here every time after church. And it's not something that I want to, you know, ignore. Our mission here at this church is to broadcast Jesus, to continue what Jesus has done in that work of making disciples. And then we, because he is so powerful, get to see him transform lives by his power. Like we get to be part of it. But our goal is to lead people to Jesus and watch Jesus work because he's that good and that powerful. We've got ultimate peace in Jesus, but we also got work to do for Jesus. That's where we land at today. So let's pray.